today we have the pleasure of having uh, Peter Brown, Do Dr. Peter Br Brown, speak to us. Uh, he uh, uh, has given a talk on the subject of COVID uh, for the Brandeis Lifelong Learning Program back in, uh, I think, uh, early November. And uh, uh, originally, we were going to just replay that talk, but he has graciously agreed to give us an updated talk because things are happening at such a fast pace that there's uh, probably a, a lot of new things to say. So anyway, uh, Peter is a uh, physician who's uh, had a career, both has practiced uh, medicine uh, in, uh, uh, he's certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. And he's uh, had a lot of interest and a, a very lively career in healthcare research. So uh, he's the founding director of the Center for the Analysis of Health Practices of the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, he's taught at Harvard Medical School and various Harvard teaching hospitals, and he's taught health policy at the Kennedy School of Government. So, uh, one of, the, uh, one of his accomplishments was as uh, one of the architects of the uh, RBRVS system, which was adopted in 1989 uh, by, uh, for Medicare. And essentially it was a system for doing a reasonably scientific evaluation of the, I guess the value of various medical services uh, the CP, you know, from the CPT, um, and uh, and this has been used to determine Medicare payments. So, physicians among you who think that you were paid too little by Medicare might be angry at him. Uh, the taxpayers who think Medicare was paying the physicians too much may also be angry at him. Uh, but hopefully. Uh, his uh, system found a, uh, at least uh, a good methodology. Uh, more recently, uh, he's been uh, uh, a member of uh, ADVARA, uh, an independent, what's called Institutional Review Board. And Peter may be able to tell us a little bit more than I can say about Institutional Review Boards, but they uh, uh, essentially, uh, uh, provides some oversight to clinical trials, and uh, and he's been involved in that for uh, clinical trials in oncology, cardiology, and other subjects. And he's recently been the primary reviewer of clinical trials of of uh, vaccines, drugs, and other therapeutics for COVID nineteen uh, underway in the U.S. and uh, and internationally. Okay, Peter. I, I hope I uh, I hope I covered that reasonably well. Well, yes, you, you certainly did. Thank yes. you very much. Yes. Uh, by the way, I just as far as RBS is concerned, what it was, it, it was a budget neutral reallocation of the money that Medicare was spending, and uh, the the reallocation gave more for uh, diagnosis and management and uh, reduced that payments for invasive procedures, surgery, diagnostics, and what have you, so that uh, basically there's a greater payment for uh, what uh, physicians do when they uh, counsel patients, manage patients, and don't do procedures. Uh, it was budget neutral. Nobody, uh, the, the total amounts uh, in Medicare have been increasing three or 4% a year uh, as, as well. But it's, it's been adopted actually by uh, universally, all of the uh, <clears throat> HMOs, insurance companies and what have you have adopted the Medicare fee schedule scale, scale uh, that was actually put into effect in 1992. It's still going. But uh, now we're on the subject of uh, COVID-19. And what I wanna say is that uh, this, this pandemic has changed our lives. Uh, over the last nine or 10 months. Uh, and uh, many of us are, you know, have been spared of it for many reasons, but uh, nationally and, and internationally, uh, this is one of the greatest calamities of, of our lifetime. 
uh, it's involved, it's created deaths all around the world and uh, more than 350,000 in the United States, as we know, uh, and had enormous economic consequences as well. Ironically, the best strategy that we have so far, never mind our modern medical system, uh, goes back to the Middle Ages. I mean, it's basically uh, what Isaac Newton did in 1665. He, uh, he left Trinity College and uh, went to the farm at Woolsthorpe, where he may or may not have been enormously productive, calculus and, uh, and uh, universal gravitation. Uh, this is what we have. Uh, we, we, we have basically behavioral change as our primary strategy today. Back, I'll be talking about vaccines and the other things uh, as well. But uh, it, it really has, uh, has changed uh, our lives and it's made life very, very difficult for many uh, of our fellow uh, citizens in the United States and citizens of the world. Uh, what I plan to, uh, to do is, is to follow this basic outline. I'm gonna talk about pandemics and I'm gonna really focus on what makes for a successful pathogen. Uh, we're going to take a, a, a look at this from the point of view of the pathogen and the virus and, and what makes for, uh, for one that uh, can do what uh, this one does. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2, that's the proper designation of the virus. Uh, what are the essentials of being a virus? The disease has a different name, as we know, it's COVID-19 uh, for uh, the COV virus in, two th in 2019. I'll talk about treatment. <clears throat> uh, that's not a very large subject at the moment. I'll speak more about epidemiology of COVID-19. And we're all learning a lot about epidemiology and infectious disease. So much of what I say is probably going to be familiar to you. What's striking though is, is that uh, this is really the first enormous public health crisis that we've, we've had. And our healthcare system in the United States has been very much uh, dominated by a high uh, cost personal health care and health insurance. And our health personal health care system is really not very well suited to dealing with a public health crisis. A lot of people in this country have no health insurance. Uh, and we've underfunded many of the institutions of public health. I mean, public health in this country is basically the the United States Public Health Service, which is designed to uh, protect us at our at our borders, and state health departments, which are which are under underfunded. But here we have now, for the first time, a uh, kind of conjunction of public health with the personal health system. It's not working all that well uh, so far. I have to tell you. I will be talking about vaccine development, which has been very exciting. And then I hope that there'll be enough time for, uh, for questions. Uh, let me uh, move on to uh, the first slide and talk about zoonoses because what we're dealing with is not a typical infectious disease, it's a zoonosis. It's a disease that came out of the uh, animal world. We're part of the animal world, but it came out of the rest of the animal world. And here are a few examples of, of other zoonoses. Uh, yellow fever uh, was in uh, Panama in the 1880s and, and uh, again in, in 1904 to uh, 1914. It came uh, from yellow fever in monkeys that were in the forest. Uh, in the 1880s, yellow fever stopped the French from uh, succeeding with building the Panama Canal. 
1904 and 1914, partly through the uh, great work of, of Walter Reed, uh, we succeeded in conquering yellow fever with a vaccine and, and building the canal. Uh, HIV, which emerged in uh, the 1970s, uh, came from uh, Central Africa where it was endemic in, uh, in chimps. And it was the intersection or interaction of humans with chimpanzees, probably through eating chimpanzees as bushmeat that uh, resulted in uh, the jump of HIV uh, from non-human primates to us. Ebola, uh, which is still uh, endemic in, in Africa, uh, is, is a virus that uh, is ordinarily found in fruit bats. We'll get back to bats again. Bats, of course, fly around, but they're mammals. So that uh, follow genetically, they're actually quite close to, uh, to us. Uh, avian influenza or, or bird flu, uh, I have in, in, in red. And the reason is that while it's in domestic and, and wild uh, birds, it is uh, the bird flu that the US Public Health Service uh, has been most worried about. Uh, the, uh, the bird flu is, uh, has infected a few individuals, uh, primarily in, in China, people who, who deal with chickens and, uh, and, and live birds as, as part of their commerce. And it, when it has uh, affected these individuals, it, it has been highly lethal. Fatality rates of 50% uh, or, or more. Uh, but it hasn't been able to spread from person to person at this point. But there is a potential that it will. And so uh, the, uh, the Public Health Service and the CDC have been enormously concerned about the possibility that there would be a pandemic of, of the bird flu. Hasn't happened yet. Uh, there was another uh, coronavirus uh, <clears throat> pandemic, or in, in, at least infection. Uh, there have been two of them, actually. One is, is not posted here. But uh, 18 years ago, we had a disease called SARS, which was in 33 countries uh, and uh, in Canada, we had uh, a very few cases in the United States. There were about 8,000 cases worldwide. The mortality rate of SARS was 10%. There were only eight cases recognized in the United States. That was a zoonosis also. It probably came from bats. And there may have been an intermediate host in Asia, uh, civet cats, C-I-V-E-T. Uh, then uh, there was another coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic uh, that uh, is still a threat, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome, uh, quite a lethal disease. This comes from camels. And now we have uh, what was called the novel coronavirus initially. Now it's called SARS, uh, COV2. Uh, the disease is called COVID-19 and it is clearly from bats. Uh, this disease, this virus or a virus extremely closely related to it genetically has been known in bats for, uh, for decades. Uh, bats tolerate coronavirus infection without harm. They can fly around, they have normal lives and reproduce and everything else. They seem to harbor a large number of genetically different coronaviruses. Um, that indicates that there's been a long period of evolutionary adaptation uh, to result in a stable host virus coexistence. What happened apparently in, in late 2019 is that one of the bat coronaviruses made the jump to, to humans. 
And incidentally, that same bat coronavirus had been studied already by uh, virologists in, in Louisiana among three or four different coronaviruses of bats that were being studied uh, there. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk up for an, a minute or two more about uh, flu because in 2007, I became aware of this book uh, and uh, I was concerned personally about the possibility of a pandemic of bird flu. Uh, and at that point, I, I bought a number of copies so that I would have them available for my neighbors, my neighborhood, uh, because it told you what you needed to do uh, if you had to uh, sequester yourself for a prolonged period of time. And, uh, and I and some, some others actually stocked up uh, our houses uh, on the possibility that we, that we might uh, have to uh, stay put for a long uh, period of time. And everything that was in this book turned out to be uh, perfectly useful and appropriate for uh, squirreling oneself away and, and making oneself uh, safe. Uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, current uh, pandemic. I want to uh, go back to what I was talking about before, and that is uh, what makes for a successful pathogen. And by, by that, I mean a, a pathogen that really is able to spread widely. Uh, the first thing is that it has to be able to transmit itself from human to human. So going back to the avian flu, uh, the disease that the CDC and the World Health Organization have feared and still fear uh, as a potential pandemic, uh, it can uh, go from, from birds to, uh, to humans. Uh, so far though, uh, human to human transmission, uh, has it hasn't really developed the uh, potential to go from human to human, but it may be just uh, a single mutation away from that. Uh, and uh, since there are recombinations of uh, influenza viruses possible in, in, in pigs or in, in other species, it's possible that uh, the bird flu virus would uh, pick up the potential for human transmissibility uh, by co-infecting uh, pigs or, or, or another species so that it, it, it's not such a, a distant uh, threat. Uh, what else makes for a successful pathogen? Well, it's this word novelty. Now, you know, it's an interesting use of the word, word novelty. In this case, what's novel about it is that there are 7 billion people in the world and nobody saw this virus until September or so of 2019. The, the entire population of the world was really virgin territory for, uh, for this virus, as, as it was for the 1918 flu virus. That was a, a zoonotic uh, uh, virus, and uh, it... Uh, emerged in a worldwide population that was just uh, wide open for, uh, for, for spread. Uh, another thing that makes for <clears throat> a successful pathogen is that uh, if there's a high proportion of infected people who aren't too sick, that's very good. It's, it's not great for a, for a virus if it wants to be successful to be too lethal. You don't want to kill your host off because it's mildly Ill, Ill individuals and as we know, completely asymptomatic individuals who are the virus uh, transmitters. So this is a stealth pathogen. Now, what about smallpox? It's interesting to talk about that. It's really disappeared in the world, but uh, smallpox was not a very successful pathogen. First of all, it either 
killed or, or immunized all of its victims. Uh, it, uh, there were also, there was no animal reservoir. There was no place for, uh, for it to, to come back from if it was eradicated. And smallpox was finally eradicated by a, uh, an immunization program uh, during our lifetime in 1979. The last case was in Somalia. That was done by essentially uh, the uh, Centers for Disease Control, working with the World Health Organization. Because <clears throat> the model of the Public Health Service and the Centers for Disease Control is uh, to protect us by going abroad and protecting our, our ports of, of entry. Uh, it's not really so much a domestic service, or at least wasn't designed to be a domestic service, so much as to be um, protection uh, for us against uh, illness that's coming from elsewhere uh, in the world. I want to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, influenza, and then I'll get back to, uh, to COVID-19. Uh, back in the 1970s, uh, I, I was picked to give the lectures on uh, influenza at Harvard Medical School in a big course we had in uh, infectious disease in the second year of, of, med of medical school. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, there was nobody at Harvard Medical School that was doing research on, uh, on influenza. Uh, there were about 30 people who taught this course and ordinarily you have some expert who's in the lab with this. Uh, and there was nobody at, at HMS uh, who was doing that for influenza. So they, they, they picked me. Uh, at that time, I knew very little about influenza. Uh, and uh, as I was learning about it, I learned of course that between 50 and 100 million uh, people in the world were killed by the 1918 uh, pandemic, more than died obviously in in the, the, the great First World War. But I also learned that in 1918, <clears throat> at the time of the second wave, when, when uh, that flu virus became more uh, virulent, uh, it, it went essentially everywhere in the world. And one of the places that it went was a place up in Alaska near, near Nome uh, called the Brevig Mission. And uh, the Brevig Mission was a very remote place. Obviously, uh, there, was, there was no international air travel in 1918. There were no roads to, uh, to, to the place where the Brevig Mission was. But it got there. And of the 77 inhabitants of the Bre Brevig Mission, 72 of them died. Uh, now. Uh, what struck me was, was the capacity of this agent to get to a place as remote as that. Uh, it probably went to many, many remote areas because the strain of influenza that uh, prevailed in 1918 subsequently disappeared. Virologists looked for it. Uh, it, it essentially was not found uh, it disappeared shortly after uh, the, the influenza 1918 pandemic uh, ended. Uh, but we'll get back to that. Uh, and as a matter of fact, later in the talk, we'll, we'll go back to the Brevig mission. Uh, I want to talk uh, now about, about viruses. Many of you uh, will know this, uh, but uh, I want to talk about how they differ from bacteria and from other, uh, of other microbes. Uh, first of all, their size. Uh, viruses are too small to be seen by light microscopes. Uh, just to uh, put it in perspective, if you look under a mi light microscope under oil immersion, uh, those of you who, who are familiar with, with, with that, and you look at red blood cells, red blood cells are, are show up pretty well. They're about seven microns in size. You can find bacteria. They're about 400 millimicrons, <clears throat> four tenths of a micron or, or one micron in size. As you know, a micron is a millionth of a meter. Viruses 
are measured in uh, nanometers and uh, the SARS virus is, around, is between 60 and a, 140 nanometers. Nanometers are a billionth of a meter. Uh, and you don't see them under a light microscope. You can see them obviously under uh, electron microscopy. Now, the thing that's remarkable about viruses is they're, they're sort of on the borderline between life and not life. Uh, you can put uh, them on the shelf in, in, uh, in a crystalline form. Uh, they can uh, almost indefinitely, uh, they can't replicate outside living cells. Uh, the term that biologists use is that they are obligate intracellular parasites. They, they, they use the uh, machinery of, of cells uh, to replicate themselves, but without uh, a living cell to, uh, to infect, uh, they cannot multiply. They are uh, essentially about as, as minimal as, as you can uh, imagine a life form to be. They're basically pure biologic information. They're either a DNA or, or RNA, there are DNA viruses and there are RNA viruses, but that's all they are, uh, wrapped in a protein capsule. The influenza virus, for example, uh, is a DNA virus. There are eight genes, that's all, eight genes uh, wrapped in a, in, in a protein uh, capsule. And those capsules are, are adapted uh, to uh, attach themselves uh, really quite exquisitely through receptor uh, uh, mechanisms to, uh, to the cells that, uh, that they infect. It's quite a specific relationship. So let's take a look at the coronavirus in general. And uh, on the left, uh, you'll see an artist's sketch of a coronavirus. I think that's probably pretty familiar it's a spherical uh, <clears throat> uh, object, and uh, the the red projections, which reminded people of a of a solar a corona, uh, is known as the spike protein, and the spike uh, protein is a very critical part of the coronavirus because the spike protein <clears throat> has the capacity to attach specifically to uh, receptors on the cell on the cell on certain cells not all cells but on uh, the cells of the respiratory uh, epithelium of of the human respiratory uh, tract and in the second uh, frame here second picture here you'll see actually two uh, coronavirus particles. Uh, here's, a, here's a particle that is just attaching. You can see on an electron um, microscopic image, the uh, spike proteins on the outside of it. Now this one here uh, has already merged with a cell. This is the cell that's being infected. It's merged with a cell, <clears throat> the spike protein has mated with a very specific receptor called ACE2, ACE2, uh, on, uh, on the cell that it's infecting, and it has spilled its uh, RNA contact into the cell where the RNA will now take over the uh, mechanics or, or, or the mechanism of the cell to replicate uh, itself. I want to go on to uh, the next, uh, we're, we're down here, I'm sorry. Uh, here to, to, to talk just for a minute about terminology. Uh, some of you may be puzzled by uh, SARS and I want to parse uh, SARS. It's, it stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Now, some people have said, well, what do you mean severe acute? Uh, that's redundant, isn't it? Uh, aren't those the same thing? 
our, our doctors being hyperbolic, that this is just bad, and so they call it severe or acute? The answer is no. This is, this is really has to do with uh, med speak and how doctors speak. The severe part of SARS means that it's severe rather than being mild or moderate. So uh, severity is, uh, in this case, uh, means it can kill you. Uh, mild or moderate uh, coronaviruses like cold viruses uh, don't. So that's where the severe comes from. Now, where does the acute come from? That has to do with time course. Uh, acute and, and chronic uh, tell a doctor whether something is going is, has an up and down in a very short period of time. Uh, so uh, this disease is acute because if it's going to kill you, it kills you in about 10 days. On the other hand, cancers are chronic disease. We have chronic obstructive pulmon pulmonary disease, disease, COPD, which goes on for uh, many years, as do, as do many other chronic diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes or what have you. So that, that uh, is what we mean when we, we talk about something as being both severe uh, and acute. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the clinical course of, of the illness. Uh, I, I looked for a, a, a good graphic on uh, COVID-19 illness and I, I wasn't able to find one. So I, I, I put this one uh, together uh, using information uh, from a, uh, a Lancet article uh, that described the clinical characteristics in course of 104 patients who had the disease who were on the cruise ship Diamond Princess. This was published in June of 2020, but it, it's still really, uh, I think, quite descriptive of uh, the course of this disease. So here we have the time course. We, we're really looking at 15 days, 18 days. Uh, and uh, if you are, happen to be exposed on the cruise ship uh, to, by a person who has the infection, uh, you'll begin to get sick in five days. That's the typical period of time uh, with fever, cough, and malaise uh, if you have mild to moderate disease but you'll begin to uh, have uh, the capacity to transmit the disease uh, because you have virus in your nose and, and uh, throat uh, on the third day, two days earlier. I think that's well known by right now. That lasts about uh, until about the 10th day. So trend, the peak of transmission is probably between uh, this third and maybe fifth or sixth uh, day. And of course, this is stealth transmission. Here we have people who, uh, who, who are feeling perfectly well. They're not coughing uh, and uh, they, they are uh, really uh, deadly transmitters uh, uh, of a disease. Uh, so on the fifth day, uh, most people who get the disease uh, will have fever, cough, malaise, meaning they'll basically feel, uh, feel pretty lousy. Uh, some of the football players who've had this feel like they were just hit by a truck. Uh, they just couldn't do anything. Uh, and, uh, and it really can, uh, can lay you low, even with, with the mild to moderate uh, disease. The real problem here has to do with a subset. About 20% of people who uh, get the, uh, the disease uh, will uh, get a worse phase of the disease that starts about on about the, the ninth day after exposure, about four or five days, really four days uh, is the median time. Uh, after the onset of symptoms. Uh, I'll go to Seattle where uh, clinicians were watching this disease and very early in the disease, what they were talking about 
was that they would have patients who had uh, fever, cough, what have you, and some of them would would uh, feel begin to feel better on the third or, or fourth day. Sometimes they would have been on uh, on ventilators, and uh, you had a situation where some of the Seattle intensive care doctors would go out and talk to the families and say, "Well, your 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 husband or your father or what have you looking much better, and uh, and really uh, we're 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 feeling great about it." So this did happen to a number of these people that that uh, they 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 felt much better, and then all of a sudden, day five, they would crash, and. Uh, they would crash with terrible shortness of breath requiring that they be put on ventilators. Their oxygen saturation would plummet. Uh, they would uh, have what we already had seen in other diseases called ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, if you're a pathologist and you look at the lungs of people with ARDS, there's practically no air in their lungs. The uh, lower passages and the alveoli get filled up with fluid and debris. And even if you provide them with oxygen, there's no way that they can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide anymore very efficiently because they no longer have well functioning uh, alveolar uh, lung function. And this is the thing that, that kills people. Uh, they also uh, get uh, renal failure. Many of these people had to be put on dialysis because they really developed uh, kidney, kidney failure. Uh, the other thing that we were seeing in this subset of people uh, was uh, a really strange sort of thing where their immune system would go, would really go into hyperdrive. And uh, they would they would really have a, a, an overactive immune system, and uh, this had also had a name. Uh, it's called cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome (CRS), where uh, you can measure a whole lot of inflammatory uh, factors in the blood that uh, bring out an inappropriate immune uh, reaction where uh, that immune reaction uh, is, it really can be, can be disastrous, it can be lethal, it can, it can be uh, fatal in and of itself. So uh, it's a complex disease. Uh, this is still going on. We still don't have uh, very good ways of dealing with, uh, with the patients who, uh, who don't spontaneously improve as do those with mild or moderate disease, but go into this uh, worse, uh, worse state. Then one other thing, and that is that uh, for people with moderate disease or people with severe disease, there can be a long tail. Uh, we're not hearing an awful lot about this because the focus is still so much on hospitalized uh, patients with, with COVID-19. Uh, but some of these people, for example, uh, have tremendous fatigue and they have, they develop uh, something that we've been familiar with called the chronic fatigue syndrome, where they have a sleep disorder, they can't concentrate well. It goes on for months and months. It's, it, it, in some people, it's never, entirely goes away. We don't know whether that's going to be the case for COVID-19, but the chronic fatigue syndrome is a, is, is a chronic uh, uh, kind of syndrome. Uh, some people actually don't get their olfaction back. As I, I think you know, one of the early signs of uh, and symptoms of COVID-19 is that people uh, lose their sense of smell. Uh, there are a number of persons who don't get it back. And that can be very disconcerting because food becomes uh, much less uh, tasty. 
and uh, people really get depressed when uh, they they no longer can uh, can can get the satisfaction that they get from the the, the taste and and smell and the full experience of uh, of, of food. And we'll probably learn more about it, but. This is not a benign disease, even when it's been mild to moderate. I think we'll be hearing probably about, uh, you know, it does involve the heart. Uh, the, the virus can infect uh, the myocardium, the, the mus muscular uh, portion of, of the heart. Uh, we've had people who have cardiac disease as a part of uh, COVID-19, and it may well be that, that there will be persons with permanent or at least long lasting uh, cardiac manifestations as a result of the disease. Now the other part of the disease is that uh, if you're gonna die of COVID-19, it happens right about here, right about the ninth day or so of illness, 14 days after you've been infected, right here at this point, this is where death occurs. Uh, so it's unusual. It, it's, uh, it is a, uh, certainly a, uh, an acute, uh, acute disease from that point of view. But let me go on to, to talk about another uh, aspect of the disease that I think we're finding is quite remarkable. And that is the extraordinary transmissibility uh, of the disease. What I'm showing you is something that was published in the uh, Journal of the Korean Medical Society uh, back in uh, September or, or possibly December. It's a very recent publication. <clears throat> but uh, this is the uh, sketch of a restaurant in South Korea. Uh, one room of the restaurant, it's about 10 meters by, uh, by, by 9.2 uh, meters. Uh, the yellow objects, which you can barely see, <clears throat> are tables uh, in, the, uh, in the restaurant. Uh, this shows you where the location is of a <clears throat> ventilating uh, a vent from the air conditioning system. Uh, and here's another one. <clears throat> there are two vents of the air conditioning system. And those of you who are, uh, are engineers will probably be interested in the fact <clears throat> that uh, the, the persons who did this study uh, looked at the airflow from the ventilators. They're shown by these solid arrows. The airflow goes down it bounces off the walls and uh, there is a <clears throat> stream of air that seems to go as a result from about here to here. Now, what we had in this restaurant <clears throat> was that we had, uh, as it turns out, a person who, who was harboring uh, SARS-CoV-2 had COVID-19 in the incubation period. Uh, this is individual B uh, at this, sitting at this table. Individual B came down with uh, symptoms of COVID two days after he left the restaurant. The other uh, people in red came down with COVID-19, turns out the same strain four or five days after they left uh, the restaurant. So this appears to be a case of where these individuals along this stream uh, became infected. There were individuals uh, sitting at these other tables who were spared. They did, they did not get infected. Now, one of the things that's interesting here, and I'm talking about the extraordinary transmissibility, is that Individual B and uh, individual uh, C or D, I can't remember which, were only in the restaurant at the same time for five minutes. The other thing is that the distance here 
was uh, 21 feet. The distance between uh, the infector who was case B and uh, the infected person who was case A was five minutes and they were separated by 6.5 meters or roughly 22 feet. Uh, the airflow here was also measured. It's about one meter per second. Now, uh, the uh, individual also infected uh, individual B who is here. Individual B was uh, 16 feet away, 4.8 meters. And uh, that person, uh, they, were, they were in the restaurant for approximately 21 minutes. We have another one of these restaurant things with that I'll show you later, but, but this one is probably uh, the most impressive evidence that I know of for uh, the long distance spread through aerosol and also through uh, a really very limited period of time of exposure. Now, this is the reason that we have super spreader events, I'm quite convinced. And the reason that we have them in closed spaces like, uh, like restaurants. So I think that the, the pro, proscription on going to the in, indoors of restaurants is, uh, is really very, uh, very well justified. I want to uh, <clears throat> begin to uh, talk about uh, how you treat and how you prevent COVID-19, uh, because we have had uh, a good period, long period of time uh, to be doing research on this already, about, about nine months in the United States. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a result, we have uh, some uh, therapeutics, but not very many. Uh, we have only, only two that are really established uh, and uh, approved, thoroughly approved uh, by the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the United States. One is remdesivir uh, made by Gilead, uh, a, a very large pharmaceutical company that's primarily involved in, in oncology. Uh, and uh, Gilead also produced uh, the, uh, it was a producer of HIV drugs. Uh, remdesivir is an antiviral. It's a small molecule drug. <clears throat> it's given intravenously. So basically it's a hospital, uh, it's hospital drug. And uh, it, uh, it is, is not a cure. It's, uh, there is a, evidence that it shortens the hospital stay. There's a trend toward lower uh, mortality, higher survival uh, in the clinical trials of remdesivir, but it's just barely short of the 0.05 uh, level of significance, P of 0.06 actually in a couple of studies that one uh, uses uh, sort of a magic number in a way, but it's the one that is formally used for uh, proof of efficacy uh, in, in uh, rather universally. But we also have dexamethasone, uh, a uh, corticosteroid that's available in generic form, long been available, long been used. Uh, dexamethasone reduces the mortality up to a, up to a third, up to 33% reduction of mortality in persons that uh, that 20% group who uh, go into the unfortunate severe phase of COVID-19. And we have a number of uh, therapeutic agents that are being used now, um, but their efficacy is not established. One is to use convalescent plasma, that is to say, plasma from people who have recovered, individuals who have recovered from COVID-19. We also have a monoclonal antibody that's produced by 
<clears throat> Regeneron, uh, a pharmaceutical company, uh, they are most useful if, uh, if they're given early to patients. They're not going to be very useful in the 20% of first persons uh, that, that are severe, uh, those people who are on uh, <clears throat> ventilators, for example. You have to use it early. Well, the problem there is we have hundreds of thousands of people uh, who have early uh, COVID-19, uh, but uh, these are difficult to obtain. It's obviously uh, the, the supply of convalescent plasma is very low and the monoclonal antibody is a biologic that is difficult to produce. It's expensive. It's in very low supply. Uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump was, uh, was lucky or fortunate to be able to, uh, to, to get it because it's not really available for widespread use. Uh, we have a drug called baricitinib, which has been used against one of the cytokines. There's a, many cytokines. One of them is interleukin-6, uh, and uh, baricitinib uh, is effective against uh, interleukin-6. And when baricitinib is combined with remdesivir, it seems to have some efficacy in COVID-19. Now, they're also using other things, obviously, because coagulation becomes a problem. People become hypercoagulable and begin to clot off their blood vessels in the brain and elsewhere uh, in the severe phase of the disease. Anticoagulants are being used in hospitals. They're obviously using oxygen. They use mechanical ventilation in some cases because the lungs no longer are a means of exchange. You put people on an artificial lung, which basically the sort of thing they use in heart lung uh, uh, machines for uh, cardiac bypass surgery. It's extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, and uh, that's translated into ECMO, uh, ECMO. Then there are a huge number of uh, ongoing clinical trials. I, I have uh, reviewed a lot of them. Uh, I should say a few more words about, about IRB. Carl Lazarus mentioned IRBs. Uh, they are really part of the regulatory uh, mechanism for all new drugs. Any new drug uh, can't, can't even, you can't even start testing it in a clinical trial without approval by two uh, regulatory bodies. One is the Food and Drug Administration. The FDA approves uh, trials primarily for their scientific merit. Uh, the IRB also is necessary uh, to start any uh, clinical trial. You can't begin a trial unless the IRB also approves. And the role of the IRB is to look at the benefits and risks of a trial, to look at the ethics, and to look at the disclosures, the cons informed consents that, uh, that people have to sign. And IRBs really came into being because of ab abuses of uh, research in humans. I think many of us know about the Tuskegee uh, trials in, in syphilis, which was a notorious kind of abuse of, of medical research. And uh, an IRB has to give a green light before any clinical trial starts. I've been on this IRB for about nine years now. We primarily were looking at uh, cancer trials, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, cardiology, what have you. Because of my background in infectious disease, uh, I, I've been on uh, the IRB primarily to look at uh, antiviral drugs, uh, antibacterial drugs, such as antibiotics. And recently, because there aren't too many infectious disease people who are on IRBs, I've become one of the primary reviewers of trials for uh, COVID-19. And I have reviewed more than 50 of them uh, during the course of this uh, pandemic. Uh, 
And I want to say a little bit about the trials in, in COVID-19 because uh, they're, they're, they're different. The trials in, uh, in cancer are, are actually designed to go on for three to five years uh, because cancer is a chronic disease, it's unpredictable. Uh, there's a long time course. And basically these are double blind uh, trials where uh, some people get the experimental drug and other people get the standard of care uh, for, for whatever that is. And the people doing the trials are blinded uh, and, and the trials are generally not unblinded for a long, long period of time. Now, because COVID will kill you uh, in, uh, in 10 days, the COVID trials are really quite remarkable. They, they are designed to uh, take 28 days. Practically every therapeutic that I've looked at uh, the, uh, the, the design of the trial is after you start it, the trial is over for that patient in 28 days. So we should be getting the answers to, uh, to, to the questions about these new therapeutics uh, pretty soon, because there were many trials that were started in March, April, May. Uh, there are more than 200 of them there that are ongoing. Uh, a few of them are antiviral drugs. Some of them are on pooled plasma and on monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are designer antibodies, and these would be antibodies that are designed uh, to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> target the spike protein uh, that I uh, described when we were talking about the virus itself. Then there, oh, there are many, many drugs that uh, have been repurposed. They, these are drugs that have been used uh, to uh, try to combat the cytokine release syndrome. They're drugs to uh, combat autoimmunity. Many of these drugs have been developed and, and really uh, tried, and some of them are already approved for use in cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and what have you. So if these drugs turn out to work, uh, there won't be an approval problem at all. They're, they're, they're already approved, they're already in commercial use, and one will simply change the labeling so that they can be used in, uh, in COVID-19. Hasn't happened yet, but I would not be surprised if in the next few months, we begin to learn that in some of these uh, clinical trials, uh, we have some, some evidence of efficacy in COVID-19. It's, it's an easy disease to study. Now, the other thing that's really quite interesting, and, and the last bullet I have here, uh, is the adaptive platform trial that's being done by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And I, I reviewed, uh, I've been reviewing this because what they're doing is uh, without going back to the uh, IRB for every change that they make, uh, they're, they're testing up to five therapeutic agents at once. Once you have a, 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 a drug that is, that is proven to be effective, they can add another drug where they have some uh, partial evidence from phase one or phase two of possible effectiveness, then they can go and add that. If that one turns out to be useful, they can then use remdesivir and drug B and add drug C. Now, why are they doing this? Well, it turns out it was first learned in tuberculosis that uh, where uh, any one drug may have uh, resistant tuberculosis, that if you add two or three drugs and use three or four of them at once, the chance of having a multiply resistant uh, strain of tuberculosis becomes very, very unlikely. The same is true in cancer. And uh, now the, the model in leukemia and cancers in lymphomas is not to use a single drug, but to use 
multiple drugs. The same is true in HIV. In HIV, use a combination of drugs and that makes the emergence of a mutation against any one of them much, much uh, 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 unlikely. It makes it basically impossible. You have to have a multiply resistant mutant uh, to, uh, to, to uh, develop mutation or resistance to multiple drug therapy. So the, this adaptive platform trial is actually a very promising way to, uh, to look at how to treat uh, COVID-19. And I'm hopeful that uh, we'll see uh, the fruit of uh, those trials uh, relatively soon. Then we have the vaccines. And now we have actually proven uh, efficacy and uh, approval of three of them, the Pfizer, BioNTech uh, vaccine uh, was the first to be approved. Uh, the Moderna vaccine is approved. And the, now the AstraZeneca and uh, Oxford uh, vaccine has been approved in Britain. I'm not sure if it's been approved yet in this country, but it's been widely approved in, in Europe. And I expect it to be approved uh, in this country soon if it's not already approved. And the more of these vaccines that get approved, the, the less of a problem we'll have with, with supply and uh, with getting widespread immunization of the, uh, of the public. I'll say there, there's one silver lining to, uh, to the widespread outbreaks that we've had. And that is that uh, the way you do these trials is you have to give the vaccine to, uh, to people who have not developed COVID-19, but who are uh, in an area where there's active uh, pandemic going on, because you want to see whether or not <clears throat> the vaccine will, will prevent, uh, prevent infection in those people. The vaccine trials are, are randomized clinical trials, uh, but Basically, the Pfizer trial, 44,000 people got, uh, went into the trial, 22,000 of them got the Pfizer vaccine, the other 22,000 got placebo. And what you're looking for is uh, the appearance of disease, and then you want to see whether or not you had significant lowering of uh, infection rates in those who are uh, who received the, uh, the vaccine. And these are single blinded trials. The investigators know who got it, but the individuals uh, do not know uh, who received the vaccine and, uh, and who did not. Uh, we were fortunate uh, in that we had um, very active uh, disease going on in the communities where these, these vaccines were used. That's one reason that we got the answer so rapidly. Pfizer very rapidly, Moderna so rapidly. Let me say a few words about, about uh, COVID-19 uh, testing. First of all, uh, no biologic test is perfect. There's a trade-off between sensitivity and the speed of results of uh, nasal swab tests. We're using nasal swab now. Initially, they were using nasopharyngeal. Uh, and what we found out is that uh, PCR tests, uh, polymerase chain reaction tests, are sensitive, but it takes a day or so, or sometimes much longer, for them to be reported. So that's been a problem. Uh, you have tests that can be reported in, uh, immediately. They're rapid, but they're less sensitive. By insensitive, what's meant there is that there's a problem of people who have the disease, but the test is negative, false negative tests. So it's not a very good idea to be using uh, tests th that are insensitive when you're screening for a dangerous pathogen. And that's exactly what happened in the Rose Garden uh, reception 
that took place at the White House. It also was the same thing that happened at the uh, election day <coughs> reception where 250 people or more were in the White House in close quarters. Uh, when they walked in the door, they were they were you they were screened with a uh, an antigen test, a rapid test. Everybody who went into the room was told they had a neg negative test. Well, obviously we had super spreaders there because uh, both in the Rose Garden and in the uh, the later uh, test uh, in the White House on election night, we had a large number of persons who became who became ill. So that's still true. I, there may be better antigen tests now, but but basically they're not they're not very good for screening uh, because of the false negatives. Uh, what I want to show you, and because this is a technical group, is something about the trade-off between uh, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, this is the ROC curve. It's the receiver operating characteristic. It's a uh, form of analysis that was developed uh, when radar was developed uh, during World War II. And I believe it was developed at MIT. Some of you may be quite familiar with the receiver operating characteristic uh, developed for radar, but it's also applicable to biologic tests like the tests we use for COVID-19. It's, it's true of practically any test that where there's a continuous variable uh, in, in, in medicine. And that is, this shows the trade-off between uh, sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is as you, as you raise the ability to find all of the true positives, uh, what happens is you go up this curve and you become less specific. Uh, in order, the trade-off here is as you become more sensitive and you pick up every, every last person who is positive, you're now finding a lot of people who have positive tests who don't have the disease you're looking for. So you need to find some place on this curve that is a good place to uh, calibrate your test so that you have reasonably high sensitivity and that you're not swamped by, by false positives. That's the, that's the dilemma of, of, uh, of testing. It's, it's pretty inescapable. And you go up this curve in the case of the PCR test by deciding how many cycles of heating and cooling you're going to use because that's how PCRs do. Every time you heat and cool, you get another exponential chain of replication of the RNA or, or the DNA that uh, you, are, uh, you are creating uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your test. I want to go on to, to talk about the pandemic that we have uh, because uh, we are now in a very, very dangerous phase of, uh, of the disease. Uh, this is the uh, current exponential uh, curve. It is uh, from the New York Times and it's updated uh, January 5th. So this is yesterday's uh, <clears throat> chart. Uh, and you'll see here, we, we had an, an early bump or peak. It hardly looks like a peak now uh, in, in April uh, and May. We had another one in the summer uh, in late July, early August. Uh, this uh, following the seven day average uh, brings us up here. We, uh, we now had the holiday season, a dip, and it looks like we're now uh, on another uh, <clears throat> big uh, path upwards. But here we're, we're at about 300, roughly 300,000 cases, new cases a day. 
of COVID-19 illness uh, in the United States. Uh, if you look at the, you can barely see them, but the individual peaks uh, are in some cases well above the seven day curve. And uh, many states are backlogged right now uh, because of the uh, New Year's and the, and the holidays. So there may be some in inaccuracy here, uh, but we're at a case now where uh, in the United States, we've had more than 20 million cases on, uh, on January 4th, I guess we had 198,000 cases reported. Uh, the deaths uh, as of January 5th in this country are at 350,000. There were 2,000 uh, de deaths reported on that day. We've had 3,000 3, 3, day deaths in the United States. And one of the problems, of course, is that this is not uniform geographically, but we'll, we'll get to that in, in, a, in a few minutes. But here, here are the newly reported deaths. Again, this is the January 4th, and we're, we're at uh, some days where we were over 3,000 deaths, record numbers of deaths in the United States, and the death rate seems to be rising as of uh, January 4th. Now, geographically, things have changed a lot. Uh, this uh, shows you where the uh, rates were the highest in, on November 12th when I gave the talk at Brandeis, where there were very high rates in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, the uh, Great Lakes uh, states, the upper uh, upper upper mid Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, uh, <clears throat> Illinois, uh, with areas with little or no uh, infection out here out west was beginning to show in Florida. Uh, we had we're just getting through with the outbreak in in New York, and it hadn't been doing very much on the west coast. Let's take a look at uh, today. Today, we have, and this is the scale here in uh, daily cases per 100,000, where at the top of the scale, we have more than 250 per 100,000, which are roughly, uh, <clears throat> yeah, 250 or more uh, per 100,000. And we have, Areas like that in rural Alaska, but down here, Southern California, the, the, the Southwest, very, very high. And in places like this, the hospitals get overwhelmed. But also we have a lot of illness that's scattered now through the less populated mountain West and, and also tremendous amount in in Oklahoma and Nebraska, Iowa, we had North and South Dakota, also uh, the Southeast. Now, the thing is it's gotten to rural areas and these are areas where uh, there's very little hospital capacity. Many rural hospitals have closed in recent years uh, because of, of the, the lack of Medicaid, partly because of the lack of Medicaid funding. These places that had very little in the way of uh, intensive care capacity to begin with. So uh, in, in these rural areas that are now being affected for the first time, uh, the uh, medical care system is, is overwhelmed. And you have situations where it's happened in El Paso, it's now happening in of all places, Los Angeles, that uh, not only are the uh, in emergency uh, medicine and the intensive care uh, staffs exhausted, but their facilities are overwhelmed. They're going to uh, 
open up field hospitals, which are intense. Uh, they're moving into schools and other facilities to, to, to harbor some of these persons. But they're also doing something else. And that goes to wartime. Uh, in some places, they're literally, there's, I forget what the euphemism for it is, but they're using triage. When facilities get overwhelmed, and this is happening now in the United States, there are many such places where uh, somebody is making a triage decision. This patient is going to enter our intensive care unit or enter the hospital and get some care. This person will not. This is a person which are basically going to, going to basically let fed, fend for himself. Essentially, we're going to let people die. And uh, uh, this is happening in America uh, today because we now have an overwhelming uh, epidemic, an overwhelming pandemic in certain geographic areas. Uh, this also is from yesterday's times. It, it, it shows you where uh, new cases are higher and where they're staying higher as of, as of yesterday. And the places where uh, this is happening primarily uh, are in the Southwest. It's Arizona, California, but also in Rhode Island, in Oklahoma. Uh, you get uh, to the uh, 16th, 17th state in order, in the order here. Uh, Massachusetts is one of those states where we are seeing uh, an increase in cases and it's, and it's getting higher uh, today. So we're not out of the woods and we haven't seen the highly transmissible variant yet. Uh, I wanna go on before I talk about the highly transmissible variant about, let's talk about vaccine development because we've seen some very uh, interesting uh, changes in, uh, in vaccine development. In the old days in vaccine development, there were a number of important uh, shortcomings. They, basically the vaccine developers started with the pathogenic virus and then they had to modify the pathogenic virus. Uh, and one of the ways to do it is with formaldehyde you can inactivate uh, a polio virus, for example, uh, with formaldehyde. Uh, and uh, if, if, you, if you use too much formaldehyde, you will inactivate it in a way that no, is no longer a good for a vaccine. Uh, but if you inactivate it too little, you have a risk that it still may be uh, <clears throat> infectious. This actually happened with the Salk vaccine, <clears throat> we had an accident where the Cutter company using Salk's uh, specific directions uh, produced large lots of vaccine. There were something like 8,000 uh, cases of, uh, of uh, polio that, are, that occurred, I think at least 30 deaths. Uh, and uh, so that was a, a, a disaster that occurred uh, with, an, with an inactivated va vaccine. And that, that's the reason, uh, one of the major reasons we went to <clears throat> an attenuated vaccine. You attenuate a virus by passing it multiple times through uh, animals or through uh, cell cultures uh, and you pick out <clears throat> mutants that uh, are less virulent. And the Sabin vaccine <clears throat> has poliovirus type one, type two, and type three, all less uh, infectious. But it's a live vaccine, and it's the standard of uh, of you in use. Influenza vaccines uh, have also been problematic because they've been traditionally been grown in hen's eggs, uh, and you don't get much vaccine out of a single hen, hen's egg. So you have to start a long, long time before you have a pandemic of, of influenza. You have to guess in 2018, which influenza strain is going to emerge in 2019. 
same for 2020, you have to pick uh, the strains that you're going to use in 2019 because you have to grow a lot of them in eggs to make the vaccine. They're now moving into, into other ways, but it's, eggs are still the primary way of making influenza vaccine. So that's the old world of vaccine development. We have this wonderful new world of vaccine development and a uh, couple of things uh, here that, that matter. One is that the uh, biologists uh, had experience trying to develop vaccines for uh, Ebola and also for the previous coronaviruses, for the MERS, which is a coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and also for SARS, which we've renamed as SARS-CoV-1. Uh, the, the 2003 uh, coronavirus. And of all things, early in January, uh, the Chinese published the exact gene sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. And so biologists were immediately able to pick out that part of the gene sequence that specified the spike protein. And they began to uh, <clears throat> make the spike uh, protein. So uh, they began to study it and they, and they developed a vaccine uh, using the messenger RNA for uh, the spike protein. So the vaccines that are, we, we have, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna, are actually uh, messenger RNA uh, that specifies the spike protein. The person gets the vaccine, their cells then uh, get the, uh, the RNA, which begins to manufacture the spike protein, uh, basically a non-infectious uh, virus uh, fragment uh, in the bloodstream of the vaccine recipient. The vaccine recipient then reacts against this foreign protein and develops antibody against the spike protein. That's how those vaccines, um, vaccines work. Now, how is the <clears throat> RNA delivered uh, to uh, the person's cells? What, how do you package it? Uh, in the case of Moderna and Pfizer, they're packaging this as a, as a lipid nanoparticle, uh, and an LNP, I wrote L LPNs, it's LPN. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's an LNP, it's a li lipid nanoparticle. Now, Pfizer uses a different lipid nanoparticle than Moderna, so because of that, because it's less stable, you have to freeze it at minus 70 degrees C the Moderna vaccine, as we know, you can, you can preserve it at refrigerator temperatures, uh, essentially four degrees C. Uh, in the old days, uh, <clears throat> the drug companies didn't like to produce vaccines. There would be no market for them. They like to make drugs for chronic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or hypercholesterolemia and, and really sell it to you for years. Uh, and uh, besides that, they had a calamity with the uh, Asian flu, where a rare, in a rare case, one in a, between one in 100,000 and one in 500,000 persons developed this neurologic par paralytic uh, <clears throat> illness known as Guillain Barre syndrome, uh, and uh, got sued because of that. And so they insist on uh, federal. A profit, profit, a product uh, safety insurance. So very few pharmaceutical companies were in the vaccine business. Uh, we're in a new world now where there's a large potential reward. And so all of a sudden you have 20 or 30 more uh, different companies developing vaccines. Now they have to go through a regulatory, there used to be a worry about it, I guess, where people said they, they weren't going to trust any vaccine that uh, Donald Trump was, uh, was responsible for. But Donald Trump has nothing to do 
with the development of vaccines, they have to go through a very rigorous uh, process where they go through phase one and two, uh, where in small numbers of healthy persons, you, you initially develop uh, uh, evidence for safety. You uh, do uh, dose, you find out what the right dose level is. These are dose escalation studies. And you find out whether they produce antibody levels. And if they do all those things, you then go on to a phase three study in a large number of persons. The model is about 300,000 persons where you randomize them one to one. Uh, you give them two doses, three to four weeks apart in the course of, a, of an outbreak. And then the data safety monitoring board compares the illness and they also compare severe illness in the vaccine and placebo subjects. Then the uh, pharmaceutical company makes the decision as to whether they're gonna submit this to the FDA. Again, it's not the government's choice here. The pharmaceutical company has to decide that. And the FDA has, a, has an outside advisory committee of, uh, of non-FDA persons who advise us as to whether or not they think it's safe and effective. At the same time, the uh, CDC uh, has a very important committee called the ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It's about 20 people. Many of them are pediatricians. It's non-governmental. It's highly prestigious. It has been the go-to group for vaccine policy. And the ACIP then uh, looks carefully at it make a recommendation to, to CDC, and uh, then we have approval decisions. Uh, in, in the case of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, it was first given emergency approval under an EUA, an emergency use authorization, which will be used liberally in, in this uh, pandemic. So here's a list of the leading vaccines. I don't know if you can read this, uh, but uh, this, are, this is only the first 10 or 12. There, there, are, there are many more. Uh, we have a vaccine, the Gamalaya va vaccine that's been used in Russia. There's the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that now uh, is approved for emergency use uh, in Britain, in India and uh, Argentina. Uh, there's uh, a virus, CanSino, which is, uh, has been used in uh, China. Johnson & Johnson has a candidate uh, virus. Uh, the Vector Institute, Novavax uh, is another uh, <clears throat> vaccine developed by uh, a, a US company that's uh, started phase three trials. We know of the Sinopharm vaccine already approved in uh, China, U UAE, UAE, Egypt, Bahrain, Sinovac limited use in China. So there are a large number of vaccines uh, that will potentially come to use in the United States. One hopes that before uh, very long to solve some of our uh, vaccine availability uh, problems. Uh, I'm qu quickly going to go through this. You know, Israel has authorized Moderna. Uh, I'm not going to talk much more about that. Uh, I'm not going to talk much more about the public health aspect of things, except to say there's a very good website that some of you might be interested in called Up to Date, where uh, with a very li limited peer review. Uh, but high quality uh, internet review. Uh, there are up-to-date information about coronavirus uh, that is published very, very quickly. Uh, this is another uh, what, what a restaurant thing that was really known much, much earlier. Uh, it was uh, known in January or February of this year from a restaurant in, in China. And I think uh, many of us uh, use this 
as critical information for uh, the proscription on indoor uh, restaurant eating. This was a restaurant in China where uh, there was uh, airflow uh, from a uh, <clears throat> uh, a source of airstream where uh, this shows you the, the, the room, there were, there were two sources of air. And in this part of the room, you had a person at this table who uh, had turned out to have COVID-19. And the persons at tables A, B, C uh, were, uh, became ill. Uh, all of the ones with red uh, markings here uh, became ill, where the persons at these tables persons at this part of the room did not. So clearly there was spread that was facilitated by uh, the airflow pattern uh, in, in this room. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about uh, is something we've been hearing about and reading about uh, recently. I know I, I've really come very much to the end of my time, but I think you'll be interested in this. Uh, the uh, highly transmissible strain uh, that we're hearing about was first identified uh, in England in September. Uh, it was designated B117. And uh, it's been found to have Excuse several me, one, se one second, Peter. Sure. Uh, I know that we're close to 1130, but I don't think that anybody's going to object to you going until you're complete. And I know that there are a lot of questions. So if you're willing to stick around, I think we are gonna keep this uh, um, Zoom open for a while. Up to oh, you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I, I am up nearly at an end uh, of the prepared remarks, but uh, <clears throat> we know that there are several mutations in the spike protein. And when you find, test this in the laboratory, you find that uh, this strain binds more strongly to the ACE2 receptor, uh, those receptors that are uh, in uh, the respiratory tract, but also widely distributed elsewhere uh, in the body. Uh, it was estimated in Britain that uh, the transmission rate was increased by 40 to 70 uh, percent, which is, which is really quite striking. And it, it has, a, when you model uh, transmission, it has a marked effect on transmissibility. It raises the number of cases uh, that one infected person is likely to, to reinfect in the course of normal community contact. It's already been uh, detected in 33 countries. So this is, this is now worldwide. Uh, the other thing we know about it is that uh, the virus is uh, more abundant uh, in the uh, nasal secretions of persons who are infected with, the, with this strain. And when you do PCR, which is also a quantitative test, uh, you find that it's increased by between one and four logs. That is to say, you have between 10 and 10,000 times as many uh, viral RNA particles of, uh, of this strain of the virus as one does to the one that has been previously uh, circulating. Now, fortunately, so far, it, it was a big question as to whether or not this is going to escape uh, control by the vaccine that we have because our, our vaccine hasn't studied outbreaks where this thing has been, uh, have been prevalent. But if you do uh, testing in the laboratory so far, the thing seems to be equally uh, neutralizable by antibody that was developed uh, by the previous vaccine. So, so far we know that uh, it, uh, we don't know for sure whether what, what the, what's going to happen clinically, but uh, if we're lucky, 
to current vaccines are going to be effective against the new strain. And it's here. Uh, it was uh, first detected in Colorado December 28th, not very long ago. It may have been here sooner because there's not much <clears throat> testing that at the level of looking for specific uh, genotypes. Uh, but it, it's now known to be uh, present in California and Florida, New York, Georgia. So uh, I think it's <clears throat> suffice it to say this, this is going to become the uh, prevalent strain in the United States. It's, go it, it's going to take over because uh, as we know about, you know, what makes a virus uh, susceptible, this thing has this property of transmissibility that is going to make it uh, the, uh, the, the more successful strain. And Dr. Ashish Jha, who was at Harvard, who's now at Brown, and I think many of our are familiar with hearing him on, uh, on MSNBC or CNBC uh, as an expert uh, epidemiologist. He's now the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown. Uh, Dr. Jha estimates that this will become the majority of new infections in the United States by March of this year. Now, if that's not enough, th there are different highly transmissible strains that have been picked up uh, elsewhere, one in South Africa and one in uh, Nigeria. So uh, we're, we're not at the end of this, uh, uh, this story. Uh, I do believe if, if we're lucky, uh, we uh, continue to follow uh, very good uh, public health practices, primarily uh, social distancing. And we ought to really be more rigorous about social distancing now that we know that the highly transmissible strain is around and, uh, and get ourselves uh, over this bridge uh, to a time when we can be immunized. And with any luck, uh, we'll, we'll have three or more vaccines and more supply and a better, better systems of uh, providing it and better logistics so that we'll be able to bring this pandemic uh, under control before many more months have, uh, have passed. Now I'd like to return our attention to the uh, Brevig mission, which I mentioned before. As we know, the 1918 influenza went to the remotest parts of the world, wherever human contact occurred. High human transmissibility, as with the current virus, made that possible. Following the pandemic, the 1918 flu virus disappeared. It was a Swedish-born physician, Dr. Johan Hulten, uh, who was a pathologist in San Francisco. And in 1951, Hulten traveled to Alaska uh, to try to isolate the 1918 influenza virus from victims who'd been buried in the Alaskan permafrost at Brevig Mission. Uh, and in his 1951 search, Halton unearthed bodies, but he failed to recover any live uh, viruses. He was a persistent man. And nearly 50 years later, in July 1997, Halton read an article in the journal Science written by the virologist uh, Jeffrey Taubenberger of the American Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Using 1990s methods of molecular biology, Taubenberger had recovered five of the eight genes of the 1918 influenza from pathology tissue of two soldiers who had died in 1918. And those specimens were stored in a pathology repository established by the order of none other than President Abraham Lincoln during the uh, Civil War. Uh, in 1997, Dr. Halton went back again to the Brevig mission. And this time 
he unearthed the remains of an obese woman, roughly 30 years of age, whose fat had protected her lungs from decay. The tissue recovered by Dr. Halton provided material that enabled sequencing of the 1918 virus, complete sequencing now. Uh, Dr. Taubenberger's laboratory revealed that the virus was a mutated bird flu. It was an avian flu. This lethal virus differed by only two amino acids specified by a single a gene from the protein of typical avian viruses, which cannot infect cells of the lower human respiratory tract. The 1918 flu virus had acquired the critical capacity to infect the lower respiratory tract all the way to the alveoli. And that critical genetic difference gave an avian flu virus the capacity for human to human transmission. An avian flu with that capacity remains as a threat of a new pandemic and remains a central concern in this field. So at any rate, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, that's essentially what I've been prepared to say, but I'm very happy uh, to take uh, questions. Hey, Peter, I just wanna thank you. I'm sure on behalf of the whole group, it's been more than amazing. And, uh, and the effort that you put into this has uh, re really you know, shown through and, and thank you very much. You're Thank getting you. applause. We don't get applause very often, but uh, <laughs> but you've done well. Yes, he uh, has. Can I, can I kick it off by asking about uh, something I read yesterday about using smaller dosages? I guess someone said, uh, a, a physician, I don't know what, what quality he is, that um, he got the same efficacy for half the dosage, which would mean that the limited amount of vaccine would carry you further. Well, that's right. I mean, this actually uh, comes from a screw up uh, that took place in England with the AstraZeneca vaccine. It turns out that uh, a, a fairly large number of persons uh, got half the dose in, uh, in the phase three trial. And when they found that out, they gave everybody the, the, the full dose. But it turns out that the persons who got half, they, they both got both two doses. The people who got half the dose uh, the first time and the full dose later, uh, that cohort had uh, better protection against infection than the full dose group. Uh, it, it was peculiar, nobody quite understands it, but that's part of the rationale. Uh, the other part of the rationale is just pure guesswork. Nobody knows whether that's the case for the Pfizer or for the Moderna vaccine. Uh, there's evidence for it in the case of, of the AstraZeneca, the, which is Oxford uh, vaccine. But that suggestion has been made. The suggestion has also been made that maybe what we ought to do is uh, spread the, back, the supply out we have now by giving everybody the first dose and uh, not reserving a lot of uh, vaccine for, for dose number two and uh, rely on the fact that the first dose produces a good deal of protection, begins after about 15 days. And if you look at, at the rates of infection after the first dose, you know that with Pfizer and Moderna that the, that the rates begin to go down. Uh, you're not protected for 15 days, but after 15 days, the first dose, full dose of course, uh, provides some protection. So those are two ideas. One is to give just a single dose to uh, give to spread the back the supply out more, and the second is to uh, to to break the dose in half. The problem is we're really going away from what's been shown in a clinical trial, and uh, the way we like to do medicine and public health is to follow. Uh, protocols and and dose schedules that have been shown to be effective and safe, and uh, you know we'd be departing from that. I, I'm, I, it'd be interesting to see what happens. 
Peter, can I ask you a question? Sure. I posed it a little bit earlier in the chat. Earlier on, you uh, showed that uh, bats are spreading the uh, COVID and other types of viruses. Uh, they're not being affected by it, but they're spreading it. Uh, who knows how, but nonetheless, they are spreading it. The point is that bats can carry it, become exposed to it, and not become susceptible or sick from it. Is there any investigation being done to find out what it is about bats that makes it so that they don't succumb to this disease? Do we have to start? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I believe it. there is some evidence about it. It may actually just be that, there, that bats, through a long period of evolution, uh, that strains of bats have emerged that for one biologic reason or another are, are, are not susceptible to illness from them. But I want to say something about the about the jump from, from bats to people. It's probably not some casual kind of contact. We know that bats are, you know, highly uh, prevalent in our own environment. They're, they're around every night. Uh, what's peculiar is that in, in Wuhan, we had a live animal market. And I, I believe that there were people who uh, might have been consuming bats. I'm not sure about that. But in the case of, uh, of SARS, they were consuming civet cats. Uh, dogs are, uh, dog meat is used. Um, and people are in close contact with live animals like bats in cages uh, in these live, live animal markets. Uh, whether they still have closed them down in rural China or not, I, I, I don't know. But uh, that's one reason that most of our pandemics have come out of China. You have people not only in close contact with these animals, but they're in markets. And, uh, and the SARS of 2003 was clearly present not only in bats, but in, in civet cats, which are, which are canine animals, they're felines. Uh, they may have been uh, infected by the bat of bites or, or in some other way from bats, and they, they might have been an intermediate host. Uh, we know of no possible intermediate host uh, in the case of COVID-19. It clears to have been a, a direct uh, transmission from bats, but it probably took place where there was intimate contact between those bats in a market probably live animals in cages uh, with close contact to, uh, to humans. So I'd be a little less concerned about the bats that we have uh, around us in, uh, in the caves of the United States and in, in uh, many places outside uh, caves. What's hey Steve, in, in, in terms of trying to uh, generate some order, there are a bunch of really good questions that came up in the chat as Peter sure. was talking. And is it possible to just scroll through those and try to take them in order so that we don't uh, get a free for all here and, uh, and just get wrapped up and we can try sure. to be efficient? Sure, you wanna do that, Peter? Or you want me to? Oh yeah, of course, that'd be fine. Uh, go ahead, Steve, why don't you go ahead and do that? Cause you may have it easier than I. Uh, one question was, uh, my wife and I have recently become less rigorous about social distancing outdoors. Is this advisable? I would say no, because I think the threat of the highly transmissible strain is there. And uh, so I would certainly use a mask outdoors. If you have an N95 mask, that's, that's probably the best kind of mask uh, to have. And uh, I'd, I'd be cautious. We know it's increasing in Massachusetts. Uh, I, I expect, I suspect that many people are becoming less cautious. <clears throat> you know, our, our, we, we have intersecting pods where, you know, one's family connects with other families. Uh, I, I, I'm concerned about the highly transmissible strain. Thank you. Next question is, 
Uh, immunization is typically two doses. If a person is fully immunized after two doses and there's a certain period of time that it takes for it to have effect, number one, how long does it take for it to have a, a full effect? And once a person is uh, immunized and it's taken full effect and they're not sick, uh, might they still be able to spread the disease to others? The answer is yes to the second question. We, we think that uh, some of the persons who don't get sick might still have uh, be able to transmit. But severe disease has, has actually pretty much disappeared uh, with these uh, vaccines. Uh, and uh, I think probably the degree of protection is very, very high uh, after the second dose. The second dose is what we call an anamnestic, uh, it provokes an anamnestic reaction. The person has already been primed with the first dose. What the second dose does is it really gets multiplication of the B cells that produce the vaccine so that you get a, a, a big uh, amplification of, uh, of cells and of, of antibodies after the second dose. But the same thing happens with illness. As soon as you've had that first dose, maybe within two weeks, 15 days or so of the first dose, you have memory cells that uh, when you're exposed a second time, very rapidly result in a proliferation of antibody producing cells. So uh, as to, as to that question, I, I think you're, you're highly protected after the second dose and probably reasonably well protected within a couple of weeks after the first. But uh, as you said, uh, it would, you would still be able to spread the disease to somebody else. Yeah, in a, in a way, we don't know the answer to that question. So I think what the epidemiologists have been saying is uh, you have to assume that it's that they're you one that potentially transmits, and so I think what we'll see is that people will be advised to keep wearing masks and to and to uh, keep doing social distancing after they've been uh, immunized. Makes sense. Okay. Next question sounds, uh, from my opinion, of more of a political type question, but I will ask it. Yeah. The uh, current vaccine pattern is like a baseball outfielder who sees a fly ball coming and runs into the dugout to grab his glove. Can you, <laughs> can you explain why immunization programs were not fully formed prior to distribution? Why not 24 hours a day, seven days a week? As I said, I think well, this is more political than a medical point of view, but I wonder if you can address well, it. It is political. I, I, I think we had a government that managed this pandemic incompetently from the very start. Uh, they basically emasculated the CDC, which is where our guidance should have come from. They politicized it. Uh, they created a, a meaningless uh, uh, office under uh, the vice president, which didn't work. Uh, they muzzled spokespeople like Burks and, uh, and uh, Fauci. And uh, this is what we, we got. I mean, this, this thing could have been controlled much better the way uh, Singapore did or the way South Korea or <clears throat> Germany did uh, initially, or even uh, Italy after they had their terrible pandemic in northern uh, Italy by by really very very stringent social distancing and mask use. Uh, yeah, it. Uh, I think things are going to be different in a few weeks uh, with a new administration. But the other part of it is that public health has been neglected in this country. We have a, a very expensive healthcare system. And uh, but we don't have universal health insurance, so the healthcare system doesn't isn't universal, and uh, most of the people who were sick and who were transmitting the, the the thing weren't even in the in the healthcare system, or many of them, many of them weren't. Uh, we we could have done much much better. 
But there are a lot of decisions that have to be made. I mean, ironically, what, what's happening now is the priority, as it should be, is being given to healthcare workers, but also to people in nursing homes and to, to older people. But if you think about it, uh, the possibly the best way to arrest the pandemic would be to immunize the people who go to bars and restaurants and who don't wear masks and don't pay attention. That's, <laughs> those are our spreaders and our super spreaders. And if you immunize them, you probably would stop the, the epidemic uh, uh, more rapidly. But I think the wise decision has been made and the, the proper and moral decision has been made that no, those people come last. We're gonna start with, uh, with our uh, healthcare workers, our, 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 prior, our people who are in the trenches, uh, so to speak, in, in, uh, in, in grocery stores, uh, the, the hairdressers, the, the, the barbers, the people who have contact with people, the cosmeticians, uh, the physicians, and uh, then the nursing homes, and then those of us who are uh, seniors. Uh, we do have another question. I believe this was posted by one of our younger members. Is there anything to the rumor floating among some young people that the COVID inoculations cause infertility? Uh, nothing that I know of, no. Uh, I think what very frequently new drugs are not tested uh, deliberately in, in pregnant individuals. And so the labeling also uh, is that there's uh, labeling of many new drugs is that they shouldn't be given to uh, women who are who are pregnant. Uh, of course, we had live we had live viruses that produce damage, fetal damage. Rubella is a case in point. Uh, I, I think that's probably <clears throat> going to turn out to be poor advice uh, for young people and particularly for 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 pregnant people because uh, whatever disease there, whatever risk there may be to a fetus, the risk of getting uh, the disease itself uh, is greater. Uh, but it does come up, and I, and I believe that the vaccine instructions nowadays are not to give it to, uh, to pregnant women or, or women who are breastfeeding. I may be wrong on that, but I think that's the case. Okay. Uh, next question is... Uh... What protocol do you use for shopping when you shop for groceries? Uh, I go to, uh, to Costco during old folks time, which is 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning when there's hardly anybody there, but I do shop. I wear an, an N95 mask uh, and uh, I've actually used gloves when I've handled stuff. But uh, yes, I have gone shopping. I didn't go shopping for a long while because actually uh, our house was stocked up for with a couple of months worth of supplies, including toilet paper. When this started, it was left over from my uh, provisions in 2007. But uh, uh, yes, I, I, I do shop. Okay. Um, Next question is, what virus proteins are the antibodies generated by the vaccines targeted? Protein S was mentioned. Are there others? It's, it's just protein S. It's the spike protein. It's that thing, that, that beautiful spike uh, that's, uh, that you see. Right here. Uh, it's that protein. And uh, so the DNA of the virus, the RNA of the virus uh, isn't, uh, isn't involved. And you could develop antibody to that protein itself. And it's actually not to, not to the native protein, but the protein undergoes 
a conforma conformational change. Uh, this is very complicated, but those of you who are chemists, uh, the uh, the cell has a has a, a serine protease enzyme, and there's a, there's a particularly specific serine protease enzyme that actually changes the conformation of the S protein in, as it um, really interacts with the ACE2 inhibitor, with the ACE2 receptor. The vaccine is actually directed against uh, that conformationally changed S protein. But I think the key thing is that, you know, people who have been immunized uh, are producing this protein. They're not producing uh, a virus. There's no RNA, uh, viral RNA. And so uh, I think this is one of the things that makes it very safe. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, one part was asked, and I'm going to add on to that one as well. First of all, have you been able to receive the vaccine? And had you a choice between the vaccines, would you prefer one over another? No, I haven't. <clears throat> I haven't received it yet. I haven't been offered a choice. Uh, and I don't think I'll really, uh, it'll matter to me uh, which one at least as far as, as Moderna and uh, Pfizer are concerned. They both had extraordinarily high <clears throat> effectiveness. Uh, and in addition to preventing deaths at a 95% uh, rate, they, uh, they had a remarkable uh, rate of preventing serious illness. So that's what that we think that if anything, people had mild illness or no illness, uh, that's basically the reason for recommending that you continue to uh, consider that you possibly are a transmitter. Okay. There are two kinds of masks that uh, have been floating around. One of them is the N95 you mentioned. There's also something called a KN95. And uh, the question is, uh, is there any functional difference between these two? Yeah, and is so you're beyond me. There might be something those about those batches ma coming from China. Uh, I don't know, although, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, someone else may have the answer to that question. Okay. And one person says, I thought it was conventional wisdom to uh, have to be in a restaurant for say two hours to contract the vi virus. This appears to be wrong because it looks like it happened in five minutes. <clears throat> Didn't sound like a question. Uh, that's right. Five minutes in uh, in that restaurant in South Korea. That's all. It was a five minute overlap in time between those two persons. So you think there could have been some overlap? In other words, the person was there for five minutes and then the other person left, but some of the virus was still in the air, perhaps? Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how it worked, but uh, there was only the, that particular article in the <clears throat> Korean journal gives you the times that each one was there, the, the estimated clock times. And uh, yeah, it, it might have been there for, for longer. Although you would think that probably people outside that one diagonal line of spread might have become infected. It looked like maybe it was just a single pass of the air that uh, could have accounted for the, uh, for the transmission because the air is going to be recirculated by that uh, uh, air conditioning system, I assume, and go elsewhere. Uh, but the only people that were infected were in that one particular stream. Okay. You know, there's one thing that nobody has ever, oh, well, there's one industry that really hasn't uh, been mentioned at all, and that's the air conditioning system and also the filtering system in the air conditioning systems. I haven't heard a word about anything that they can do or have done, if you will, to try to capture the virus 
during the filtration of the air, the going through the systems? Um, yeah, I don't know either. I think you'd have to do it knowing something about the chemistry of the virus, because obviously it's nanometer size, uh, smaller than a bacterium. And so uh, <clears throat> there's a very small particle. So uh, I imagine it's the material in the, in the filter system uh, rather than the pore size of the filter system that, that would matter. Uh, if you can, <clears throat> you can also uh, inactivate viruses with ultraviolet light. That's my point, so, right. Uh, UV uh, is pr probably something you could use. And it may well be that, you know, environmental scientists are, have the answers to some of this. I, I imagine it's being studied. It's not something I, I know a lot about. Okay, no, I don't you. know much about it either, but you know, oh. when you start thinking about our, in, our lives and their interactions, you know, these are the little side issues you got to worry about, especially with this pandemic. Right, but obviously, you know, we're not going to trust the air conditioning systems of restaurants or, or rooms or what have you. Uh, okay, um, we have a couple more questions here, if we can uh, switch here. Uh, how about a hybrid vaccination system? They've been talking about, uh, well, you need two doses. Well, maybe we we'll just give one dose. How about if we did a hybrid, he's suggesting, two doses for hospital workers and the elderly and so, and so forth, and one dose to an entire community in the high-risk communities so that we can get it to more people well, and concentrate yeah, it on certain that, that, that would uh, make sense. You know, one hopes that the, the shortage of supply doesn't last too much longer uh, because that's that's the kind of thing you would go to, uh, you know, under conditions of scarcity. Uh, they're tooling up to make enough uh, vaccine for 7 uh, billion people. We're talking about, you know, billions and billions of of, uh, of doses. And I think the model is going to be the, uh, the licensing out of uh, the Pfizer, Moderna, and other vaccines so that you can amplify the, uh, the production. But yeah, th I think that's a, that's a public health call that, you know, would, might make a lot of sense. Two doses for the uh, Healthcare providers, first line workers, and uh, one dose for everybody else, and you'd get a to get the public immunized much much more rapidly. Thank you. Uh, that's all I see for questions in the chat. Did I miss any? Uh, Steve, um, is it possible to see the slides that were skipped? I can I ask a question? All the slides will be will be posted. No, they won't. John, they will not be. Uh, Dr. Brown has asked that we not post the slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't know if I skipped any. Actually, I don't. I don't think I skipped any. Uh, they were twenty through twenty-two. Twenty. Yeah, you didn't 20? show twenty. You didn't show Massachusetts, for instance. Let me show them now. Uh, I guess the places hardest hit. Yeah, I, and I can talk about it if you want to hear a little bit more. But we're now in these places that are like the Brevig uh, Mission. These are these tiny places: Pershing, Nevada, the Bethel Census Area of Alaska, Bent, Colorado. Now these are places with probably little or no. Uh, hospital capacity, certainly no intensive care. And this is, people are going to be dying in these communities. They have to get to someplace where there's, there's care. These are hard hit spots. Uh, and uh, so in Pershing, Nevada, you have uh, 834 cases. You have a thousand cases per hundred thousand persons. Uh, there are significant cult, uh, clusters. Uh, we know about the uh, 
the, the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt, but also in the Savannah River uh, nuclear uh, reservation, uh, the Wynn Las Vegas resorts, Los Angeles apparel clothing. And here now we have another cruise ship, Trenton Psychiatric, Psychiatric Hospital. And, and I was interested in this one. This is in a, a Redding, California. The Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry uh, is a cluster of cases. But we look at Massachusetts, we have the most active uh, cases up here, <clears throat> Northeastern Massachusetts, I guess that's Lowell Lawrence, down here in Taunton, uh, Fall River area, out here on uh, Nantucket. Very little good health care uh, in Nantucket, M central Massachusetts. And we have moderate uh, transmission here, here in, uh, in our part of Massachusetts. And these were on vaccine development. I, I think this is where I went back online. Yeah, those are the slides that you missed, Peter. There's, there yeah. was a couple there. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm looking out uh, a little further and it seems to me that there's going to be a lot of pressure put on to get schools open in the fall. Uh, what, uh, what's the likely scenario by fall for, for uh, our situation? I think that'll happen. I, I, I believe that we'll have widespread uh, immunization uh, by the summertime, by certainly by July or, or August. But another possibility, you know, is that uh, schools right now require that people be immunized for meningitis. Uh, for uh, obviously primary schools, you need to have immunizations for all the childhood diseases. And this is what pediatricians do. I would not be surprised if schools, at least some schools, require proof of immunization uh, to, uh, to attend in the fall. And they will certainly want all of their faculty and, and staff, and the faculty and staff will themselves want to be immunized. And I think the logistics are such that we'll probably have enough supply of multiple vaccines by then. But that's an opinion, I could be wrong, but I, I, I believe so. Your crystal, your crystal ball is not that, not that well. I can tell way. you, my, my granddaughter who lives with us, is planning to go uh, to the University of Vermont in the fall. <laughs> Peter, I, 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 I want to thank you again. I think uh, we've, we've really taken a lot of your time and much more than you anticipated. So uh, I think it's the kind of thing that we're all very interested in and we could spend a long time discussing this. So uh, let me respect your time and thank you on behalf of the group. And uh, we, we all appreciate the knowledge and, and insightfulness that you brought on, on this really pressing issue. Well, thank you, you know, for, you know, staying with me for such a long time. I, I hadn't planned to go on uh, this long, but what I, I can say, if questions occur to you, uh, any of your, your members, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to get in touch with me. You can, you can email me, it's peterbraun at mac.com. And uh, you know, Carl and, and others have my email address, Peter Braun. it's simple, no, no punctuation there at mac.com and I'd be happy to respond to to any That's questions. Amazing. Thank you again. Yes, thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic.